Taking us on this journey in our very first power session will be Johannes Horsch. He is a group manager, medical assistance systems at Fraunhofer IPA Clinical Health Technologies Department in Mannheim. And since 2017, he has led the medical technology assistance systems group, focusing on AI-based and robotic assistance systems for healthcare, as well as uh, the application of 5G and AR slash VR technology in clinical settings. And now in this uh, Power session, we'll find out about the intelligent assistance in the OR. Johannes, with that, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Kind of difficult to pronounce. A little <laughs> bit, yeah, sorry. In German, it's easier, but I will give my very best to pronounce it good in English. So, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and to uh, have the possibility to speak to you about intelligent assistance in the OR. Um, my name is Johannes Horsch. I'm a mechanical engineer and I'm from Fraunhofer IPA. And Fraunhofer IPA is the Fraunhofer Institute for Manufacturing, Engineering and Automation. Um, and the IPA is one of the largest institutes of the Fraunhofer Society with nearly over 1,200 employees. And I'm from the Department for Clinical Health Technologies. Um, we work at the interface between automation and medicine and are located on the campus of the University Hospital of Mannheim, which is located in southwest of Germany. And we work on, on some clinic-related research topics, especially on patient data collection and analysis, connected healthcare, intelligent OR assistant, and single cells for a personalized therapy. So our research topics are oriented at the patient journey of the patient in the clinical and in the hospital environment. So what you see here is a part of our lab environment. Uh, we have an experimental hybrid OR. It's a very realistic development environment in which we develop and test and validate our developments. And this is a fully equipped operating room with an integrated X-ray system. And typical medical applications uh, for this kind of room are from cardiology, neurology, and oncology. And we equip this room with the latest technologies. For example, we installed the private 5G campus networks, which will uh, I will come back a bit later, especially a good basis for collecting data, as we had in the discussions before. Um, we have several edge computers, robotic platforms, and our own AI-based control systems, also for robotic systems. And what we're currently working on is on connecting our OR um, in Mannheim with operating rooms in Strasbourg in France and in an operating room in the German capital of Berlin at Charité Hospital. And this work is done in our project, uh, in our current research project 5DOR, with the goal of establishing the next generation of an 5G-enabled operating room ecosystem to improve patient outcome. And this is an international Franco-German collaboration project with eight partners from industry, from healthcare and research organization. So why do we need 5G in the operating room? So First, medical errors and healthcare-related adverse events occur in 8 to 12% of the hospitalizations. And here the OR is a very complex environment. So digitizing the OR as a central part of the hospital ecosystem is a very important opportunity to introduce a value-based healthcare with outcomes which truly matter to patients. So this digital OR enhancement via a secure, flexible, and reliable high-performance wireless communication can help to avoid errors and improve workflows. So we think that 5G technology will transform the healthcare, sec healthcare sector into a new connected ecosystem and improve patient care significantly. And in this context, the OR is a key element. So we put together a Franco-German consortium um, with three hybrid OR environments. We have a unique multidisciplinary consortium, which is well balanced between healthcare, R&D and industry. And we're addressing the whole value chain of 5G applications. In France, we have three partners. We have a network technology provider, Bcom. We have research organization, IGU in Strasbourg. We have a startup, RDS. In the German capital of Berlin, we have Charité Hospital, we have a small SME, Sectorcon, and in the south of Germany, um, we are working with uh, 
MedTech Company, Karl Storz, Reutling University, and also well our our department of Fraunhofer A Fraunhofer APA in Mannheim. So we select in our project four relevant use cases which will show the benefit of 5G in the OR. On the left side, you see two use cases which deal with the real-time analysis of massive data in the OR, and on the right side, there are robotic applications. Use case number one is the AI-assisted monitoring of vital signs. Um, for example, anesthesiologists can be assisted analyzing vital signs of patients with AI algorithms. Use case number two is the cross-border robotic telesurgery. Uh, we, have, we are envisioning um, telesurgery between Mannheim and Strasbourg. Use case number three is the AI analysis and provision of surgical data. For example, endoscopic images or videos can be analyzed in real time with um, AI algorithms. And use case number four is the mobile robotic OR assistance. So AGVs or automated guided vehicles can be used for logistics processes in the OR. And these four use cases uh, will be implemented in our three OR test environments, which are equipped with interoperable 5G infrastructures located in Strasbourg, Berlin, and Mannheim. And this approach will demonstrate first um, a technology transfer into realistic clinical settings and applications, and second, the transfer of R&D results, as well as a flexible use of different 5G components across the Franco-German border. So I would like to dig a bit deeper into the telesurgery use case. Um, at our institute, we developed a system called Gaidu. It's a robotic assistant um, assisting with needle interventions. Um, such uh, interventional lead needles you can see in the figure on the right side are used, for example, for taking biopsy samples, but can also be used for treating tumors in the liver with RFA needles. So the system is currently being commercialized together with a um, German company, and the first studies we, we performed were very successful. Um, the time we save in the intervention is up to 50%. We lead less iterations. Um, Placing the needle, the system is precise and placing the needle safe and user friendly. And I have here a little video about the workflow. So the planning is done in the software on, on a CT, cam, CT scan of the patient, and then the needle is placed virtually. And this information is then sent to the process and sent to the robot. And this robotic arm has a special tool at its tip. It's a tool which helps guiding the needle, and this tool is then placed above the patient in the right position, so that in the final step, the physician can just introduce the needle um, with a manual process. So this, pro this, this, this system is very promising and works very, very good, but it still has some challenges. Um, <clears throat> so the physician is still in the operating room and is exposed to radiation. Um, and this needle insertion process is still a manual process. So at the end, it's dependent on the skills and, and the expertise of the local available expert. So we're trying, we're trying to address these challenges with a remote approach, with a remote system for needle interventions, with some haptic feedback. So with this remote system, we have the opportunity to transfer this surgical skills expertise into remote sites or even harsh environments like in emergency settings, infectious settings, or dangerous settings. And in this in the system for telesurgery, the haptic sensation is a key modality. Well, we have to transfer audio and video as information, but for the physician, this haptic feel is one of the most important sensations. But on the same side, at the same side, at the same time, the sensation is also most critical regarding latency. And here comes 5G into play. Um, 5G is an enabling technology. It promises a safe, fast, and robust communication infrastructure. And in general, this will be a key element for data-driven patient care and a basis for the play application of AI algorithms in the OR um, in general, as I showed in the examples before. 
So on the right side, you see our car, our plant setup. Um, we will have a master control which is located in Mannheim and operated by the physician. And these commands are then sent to the slave robot, which is located in Strasbourg. And the slave robot inserts the needle and pushes this into the tissue and is also equipped with force sensors. And these force measurements are then sent back to the master control in Mannheim, where the surgeon then can feel the resistance of the tissue and have full control of the intervention. So the system is currently still under development. We already could establish the direct communication link between the two ORs in Strasbourg and Mannheim and are currently working on the robotic system, which will be probably uh, where we will probably be able to perform first experiments at the end of the year or the beginning of next year. And I have one another last example i brought to you um, for robotic assistance it's about catheter-based interventions for example for the treatment of strokes alone alone in germany there are approximately 270,000 strokes per year and in general stroke is the second most common cause of death worldwide and the gold standard of care is the so-called thrombectomy you see it in the figure on the right side a small a catheter or a guide wire is introduced into the groin of the patient and then pushed and navigated through the patient body to the lesion in the brain. And as you can imagine, this process is very difficult and time consuming. The physician can only push and rotate the guide wire and the vision is also very, very, very bad as you see in the fluoroscopic image on the right side. So this takes this process, this navigation process takes a lot of time, which is not good for the treatment of the patient because there's a saying, time is brain. The faster the patient gets his treatment, the better the clinical outcome of the treatment. So we are working on an autonomous um, navigation robotic system, which is trained via reinforcement learning. You see our current setup on the figure on the left side. We have an um, two-dimensional um, guide wire manipulator. This ma robotic manipulator can push and rotate the guide wire. We have the synthetic vessel phantom, and this robotic manipulator is controlled by a neural network. Um, and this neural network, the control system, is trained via reinforcement learning in the simulation environment, which you see on the right side here. And um, during the training process, um, the, the algorithm is only trained in the simulation, the virtual simulation environment, and after some runs, it's validated on the test batch. And you see it in this short video here. Here's the simulation model. You see the guide wire navigating to the vessel anatomy, and this yellow dot is the target. And for example, after 1,000 runs, um, this control system is validated on the test batch, which you see here. So the target is this green dot. And in, the, in this first validation step, you see the system still needs some attempts, a lot of attempts to get to reach a target. After 3000 runs, the system gets more intelligent, I would say. It just it needs shorter time to get to the target. And after 5,000 runs, you will see it in the next scene of the video. Um, it reaches the target just in the first try. So we were very surprised how well this worked, especially the transfer from the simulation environment to the to the real test environment. But however, there's still some challenges for the future. The system needs to be generalized for different patient anatomies, for larger models, for three-dimensional models. But in our opinion, these are very promising first results and a good outlook for assisting interventions in the future. So thank you very much uh, for your attention at this point. Um, I hope I could give you some interesting insights into current developments and would be very happy to discuss uh, with you in the next uh, Q&A session. Thanks. 
Fantastic, Johannes. Thank you so much. Uh, and yes, as mentioned, we have a Q&A session coming up at 4.30. So if you have any questions for Johannes or also our next Power Session speaker, please feel free to post them right in the chat. And with that, uh, let's get back to our panelists from earlier. Dr. Rolando del Maestro is with us once again. And now we can find out more about his area of expertise and how fusing artificial intelligence and virtual reality can be used to improve improve surgical performance. Rolando, I may hand the stage over to you again. Well, thanks again uh, for, uh, for allowing me to share a little bit of information that we're uh, involved with at uh, McGill and the Neurosurgical Simulation Artificial Intelligence uh, Learning Center. My, my topic is really artificial intelligence and virtual reality to improve surgical performance. And really, it's really about the development of the intelligent operating room of the future. So our vision is really the globalization of safe surgery through the utilization of simulation artificial intelligence. And really what we want to do is put patients and, and, and learners in particular into immersive learning environments. And immersive learning environments really are interactive. They're learning. They can be physical or virtual. And we predominantly use virtual reality. So some of the questions that we've been looking at are, what are the composites of technical surgical expertise? What actually is it related to the actual movement of the hands? What are the best ways of teaching those particular composites? And what is the role of artificial intelligence and tutoring systems? And what does the future operating room look like? And I'm gonna focus only on the last two questions. So really, what do we wanna do? So if you look at how surgical expertise is taught, you learn a little bit during your uh, medical school training, which you can see here in yellow. Most of the training involves during your residency. At the end of your residency, you're considered to be competent and therefore considered to have a competent performance. And the vast majority of individuals, for example, do a fellowship in surgery. And then you increase your surgical skills till you reach your peak surgical performance. And then you become a recognized expert. So this is sort of a, a timeline of what happens in a normal sort of uh, learning environment that occurs in uh, hospitals throughout the world. So what do we want to do? Well, what we really want to do is improve the amount of learning you have during your residency. You want to be able to be more competent when you finish your residency and you enter your fellowship to get to your peak surgical performance earlier, be a recognized expert for a longer period of time. And then really what we really wanna do is move this curve as far as we can to the left. So you reach your peak surgical performance, your each individual's peak surgical performance as quickly as possible and stay there for as long as possible to have the most uh, sort of important and effective way of treating patients during that particular surgeon's lifetime. Now, so what is the arc that's involved in this? Well, as I mentioned before, you have to build and acquire simulators, which appropriate tactile and visual reality. So they have to feel like you're really operating on which, which in the human and they have to look the same. You have to validate those particular systems. You have to determine if those simulators actually improve operative performance, and you can develop these intelligent tutoring systems and the intelligent pivot. So what do these systems look like? Well, one of the ways you're going to look at it is these systems become relatively can be this is a virtual reality system. You can see here, here's here's a tumor that you can see. You can hear the environment. The, the brain actually pulsates during the operative procedure and moves it, the tumor bleeds. We've put the exact same uh, technical information from tumors that we remove in the operating room into the system. And this is the cauterization that occurs, for example, on the surface. So you get an impression of what actually these virtual reality systems look like. And then there's a huge amount of data that you get from these systems. And then the next question, one of the things that we've done is we've developed a virtual operative assistant. And the virtual operative assistant is really an intelligent tutoring system. And it really focuses on safety to make absolutely sure that the individual who is being trained in this particular system is safe 
before they're actually trained to do other types of activities. For example, how to be efficient in the movement of, of uh, the instruments, in particular in the movement and training of the left hand. And we have a, a pattern that's ongoing related to this particular operative assistant. The problem with this assistant, this system, however, was that the training occurs after the operative procedure. In other words, at the end of the operation, this particular system kicks in. And we felt that that's not how real uh, surgery is taught. So uh, we've, we've also tested this particular system. And what we basically did is had a control group, which basically were individuals who were uh, just allowed to do these operative procedures. We had a virtual operative assistant group, and we also had an instruction group. In this first clinical trial, this occurred during COVID, so we could not have the instructor in the operating room. We had to have the instructor online. And therefore, uh, the information in this was interesting for a number of reasons. We got emotional. Uh, information before and after the procedures, and also we're able to test cognitive load. So we're not only testing how the individual is doing the operation, but how the emotions are occurring during the operations, how they affect performance, and how what is the cognitive load that that particular individual is experiencing during the operation. And to give you information related on the, on the results of these uh, first uh, uh, sort of uh, clinical trials, what you can see here, I guess there's two things that you can learn here. One, Virtual training an operative procedure in a virtual reality world in which the expert is not in the operating room is really not better, if you can see the two lines at the bottom, than actually having no training whatsoever. And you can see that the virtual operative assistant has improved performance. As you can see, the, the individuals who are in this virtual uh, world, uh, as far as operations is concerned, continue to improve their performance uh, significantly better than the two other groups. So that was the virtual operator assistant. Um, Now, the second system we've developed is called the Intelligent Continuous Expertise Monitoring System. In this particular system, we, we train the system using 14 neurosurgeons and 84 simulated operations and really wanted to know what were the things that differentiate ex, uh, expertise and can differentiate training levels. And what this particular system does is to give you the information here we could show the difference between, let's say, experts, uh, surgeons, senior residents, junior residents, and medical students, and we could actually predict what year of training the resident was in based on these particular systems. So what do these systems do? Well, basically, we have in the background, we have five algorithms that are running continuously, and they're assessing, for example, the bleeding rate, the tissue injury rate, the amount of force that's being used, the tip separation, the force that's being applied with the right and the left hand. And actually, during the procedure, what happens is if the intelligent tutor finds that the information is uh, the, the uh, student or trainer, uh, trainer is, is, is having a problem, then what happens is the machine actually talks with you. And it tells you, for example, use, keep your instruments closer together use less force with your left hand. So we have six different things that are being trained continuously during the operative procedure. And so what we did then was, what could we assess expert instruction with the actual expert in the operating room and AI coaching? So what we basically did there is ran another three-armed randomized control trial where the individuals, for example, with the post-op training, they just got the information at the end of the procedure. This is the group on the top. The second group, which were the AI coaching group, this particular group, they were assessed during their, their uh, operative procedure, and then they were trained during the operative procedure in a verbal format. And at the end of the procedure, they were shown their errors, and they were actually shown a perfect uh, operative procedure to prevent that particular error. And the third group were actually trained by experts. And in the experts, the experts were used verbal training during the procedure. At the end of the procedure, the, the uh, expert could actually show the uh, trainee how to actually do the operation and actually summarize the procedure. So in other words, what we're doing is really looking, is the AI coaching system better than expert trainers who are actually in the operating room and training the person while they're doing the procedure? And our results basically, if you can see here, the red line is the ICMS the artificial intelligence system. The yellow line is the experts. And you can see the experts seem to be good at initial training, but over time, 
the training seems to fall down, fall away. So again, it suggests that the ICMS or these intelligent tutoring systems, because they have so much oper so much information as to what actually is going on during the operation, that they actually can improve the performance better than the expert. So the conclusion of this particular idea would be these real-time intelligent tutoring systems that actually talk with you, find out what you're doing, and actually give you more information are seen to be an efficient surgical uh, training system, and it is at least comparable to in-person human expert median trainer, and possibly in some situations better. So the next question is, how do we use these particular ICMS systems to develop the smart operating instruments in the intelligent operating room in the future? Well, what we basically have done is we develop a hybrid operating room, and you, you can see a little bit uh, in the previous uh, uh, presentation of what this may look like. But basically, what this is is an uh, it's an intelligent operating room, and the intelligent operating room looks like a real operating room, but all the instruments are tracked. So all the instruments are tracked in the operation. So the instrument they we know for example how far the instruments are together we know what how the instruments are accelerating decelerating and we have a lot of data related to everything that the instrument is doing there in the operation and the it's really a bridge between the human uh, uh, operation and the uh, in vitro uh, sort of operations that occurs associated with the uh, uh, visual reality. So here, here for example, you have the uh, calf brain is being operated on, and all these instruments, all the movements are being tracked during the procedure from, from that aspect of it. So we're basically trying to reproduce the virtual reality world in this particular world. And you can see here that while the individual is actually doing an operation, that all the the movement of the instruments, the acceleration of the instruments, how, the, how close the instruments are together, are uh, assess continuously do, during the procedure. So what we're doing now, we've just finished it, is basically following up and doing a situation where we're training half our, our, half our uh, uh, residents in the virtual reality world and in the training, uh, not training the other half, and then assessing them in this in this hybrid sort of uh, ex vivo brain calf world from that point of view. So what is the world going to look like in the future? Well, potentially, what we'd like to have is a system that during the during an operation, we're able to assess multiple different things that are going on during the operation and be able to assess that operation and hopefully mitigate and prevent the progression of the errors. So there's a whole group that's associated with this particular uh, procedure. And if people are interested in what we're doing, they can visit our website and they can actually follow us on, on Twitter. But if you're interested at all, please visit our website. You can see all our papers and what we're doing at the present time. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rolando, for sharing with us the exciting work that you're doing. We'll have a quick look at the chat if there is any questions for you or Johannes at the moment. I don't see any uh, currently, but I have a question. A little bit earlier on in your presentation, you showed us an image of the peak surgical performance uh, and how this, uh, I guess, window could potentially be elongated. Now, is this elongation something that can only happen early on in the career or what happens past 65? Can the window be extended? past 65 also? This is a very difficult question. And what we do know, for example, which we have a lot of information in the aviation industry, is individuals after uh, 65, when they're placed into a simulator, do not do as well as they did previously, generally speaking. And so, for example, you do not see a great number of, of pilots who are piloting uh, commercial airlines who are over the age of 65. And in fact, at one time, the cutoff was 60, and now it's a little bit higher up. So what, what we don't know in surgery is how, how does your circular skill set decline over a period of time? And when we get further information about that, we'll be able to maybe answer that question a little bit more. But as I was mentioning before, um, there are synapse, substantial numbers of changes that occur uh, with very complex bimanual performance as we age. Some individuals have very little change or other individuals do have change. And so there's a great deal of variability in this particular uh, phenomenon. So we do not know, we do not have the data that they have in the aviation industry to make any sort of comments about this at the present time. But thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um... 
I have a question for Johannes, and it's a question from Annika Lenz. Um, and she's saying, it's fascinating, Johannes, that you utilize models to train algorithms, but where else do you source data for the development of these algorithms? Do you encourage any challenges in inquiring such data? Oh, yeah, it depends on which kind of problem we're dealing with. For example, um, uh, of course, as, as a discussion we had before, um, the acquisition of data is probably the most difficult <laughs> part of that. And especially thinking about um, there is a lot of data available, but in, not in a structured or way it can be used for, 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 our, for our systems and AI developments. So uh, talking of maybe about uh, the AI autonomous um, robot, um, in that case, um, it is indeed possible to to use pre-operative CT data, for example. There are some I didn't show that, but there are some techniques, for example, for to perform with another AI algorithm to do some image segmentation and get the 3D 3D information for the models out of the CT imaging and <clears throat> model it in 3D and uh, environments and use this again for training. But this is a lot of still the pipeline needs to be established and you need a lot of a, a lot of manpower and a lot of uh, uh, computing resources to perform all this all these steps so um yeah the, so the data is available um but um a big thing is the workload for annotating this data for for working it to make it available for for the for the AI systems. And the other point is not talking only about the technical aspect from the data, but also the regulatory point of the data. That's another big issue. So we are cooperating, for example, here also with the hospital clinic of Mannheim. Um, they have uh, there are some initiatives to store data, but the access, as we are not the part of the hospital from an organizational point of view, <laughs> it's pretty difficult to comply with all the regulative rules, data protection, um, to, to make sure that the data, which is an important part, of course, but we need to find ways how to make this data accessible for, for developing systems, because there are a lot of opportunities which we can uh, use and improve our AI systems with that. So there are different ways to get to the data. There are some basic, of course, radiological images are an intrinsic way images are available, but there's a lot of more data in the operating room. And it's uh, like Rolando uh, described before, that's a, that's a nice approach to gather data from the instruments to have the whole situation and put it together in the, in the whole OR situation for process improvements. Yes. Absolutely. Johannes Rolando, thank you so much for these uh, amazing insights. Thank you so much for taking the time to participate uh, here today at Science Meets Industry.